Hey everyone, this is Dr. Mark Kahn, and this is chapter 16 on the human nervous system. We know that the human nervous system allows us to gather, process, and organize information about the world around us. Um, we're going to cover some topics such as what does cocaine do to the brain? Why are our brains so remarkable? Who is HM and why is his brain the most studied brain in history? And we know that uh, the nervous system is composed of two parts. We have the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system and organs contained within both systems. So what makes us, us humans, different than our primitive relatives? As we can see, humans and primates came from a common ancestor millions of years ago. However, through evolution, through natural selection, allowed our species, uh, species homo, homo sapiens, to become the humans we are today. This YouTube vet video is actually a very good talk um, done by Susanna Herculano Huzel. Um, she talks about what makes our brains, our human brains, so remarkable. Um, basically, you know, we know that human brains are awesome. Our brains are gigantic, seven times larger than they should be for the size of our bodies, and use about 25% of all the energy the body requires each day. And they become enormous in hardly any time in evolution, leaving our cousins, the great apes, behind. So what so the human brain is special, right? And what makes our brain special? Well, she talks about how um, compared to other animals and other primates, uh, through evolution, our brains have become special. Now, brain size does not necessarily mean more neurons, specifically in the cerebral cortex, that our part of the brain that deals with logic um, and judgment and, and motor skills. Um, so the brain of, say, a whale might be larger than our small human brain, which only weighs about 1.2 kilograms, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have more neurons and are more intelligent um, than we as humans, although we can't really measure intelligence in, in whales. We're just going to assume that we are more intelligent. So we know that these neurons require a large amount of energy and animals, most animals, most primitive animals spend the majority of their time either looking for food uh, and eating food to fulfill this large energy requirement. And she says what separates us from other primates actually was our ability to learn how to cook our food. We are the only animals that know how to cook our food. And this allowed us to get a large amount of energy requirement in a small amount of time, giving us more time to do other things that would develop our brains, things that would interest us, uh, learning new skills uh, so that we can develop our brains, specifically our neurons within the cerebral cortex. So through evolution and this ability to cook food, humans were able to obtain the largest number of neurons within the cerebral cortex um, compared to other animals. And this is what makes humans special. So some of the learning objectives for this chapter. First, we want to describe the cells and organization of the human nervous system. We want, to be to, we want to be able to explain the biology behind reflexes and pain. We also want to connect the structures of the brain with their functions. And then we want to be able to solve problems related to malfunctions in various brain regions and uh, sensory structures such as the eye. So consider this scenario. You accidentally grab a very hot object. You quickly pull your hand off. Later, you feel pain and treat your wound. Now here are some questions to consider. Why were you able to remove your hand so quickly? And why do you feel pain afterwards? Well, these speedy reactions are made possible by your spinal cord. Um, later, we'll learn that these speedy reactions are also known as reflexes. So we have our spinal cord to thank for that. The spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, and we know that um, information is brought up the spinal cord to the portion of the brain that uh, processes uh, sensations such as pain. Um, and then from there, 
it will send that signal to the motor area where um, that motor signal will go down the spinal cord to the muscle, in this case your arm, to pull your arm away from that heat source. So here is just uh, the idea of um, how information is passed up the spinal cord as well as down the spinal cord. So for example, we see a tall glass of water. The photons that are hitting this glass are then uh, carried to the eye where it is transferred into signals that will then be uh, sent to that area in the brain that processes sensory information. Um, and we have what's known as integration. Integration is basically the processing of the sensory information. And from there, it gets passed along to the motor cortex of the brain. So motor information is sent down the spinal cord to the effector organ, in this case, the skeletal muscle in your arm, uh, where it allows this muscle to basically pick up the glass of water so you can drink it if you're thirsty. Now we know that pain sensation is actually interpret, interpreted in the brain. So pain is in the brain. To understand how things work, we do need to learn the structure and organization of the nervous system. We know that any system is made up of tissues and tissues are made up of cells. So nervous tissue is responsible for exchanging electrical and chemical messages. Uh, the specific cells that make up nervous tissue include neurons as well as glia cells. Neurons, there are many kinds of neurons. Um, they are excitable. And then we have glial cells. So these are basically support cells for the neurons. Um, they are sort of like the glue that holds these cells together. Um, and these are non-excitable. We take a look at the basic structure of a neuron. It basically has the same structure of most cells. It has a cell body. It has organelles such as a nucleus. Um, the only thing that might be a little different from a neuron compared to other cells is that it has these um, branches that are responsible for either receiving chemical signals or passing along uh, signals. So we see the basic structure of a neuron. We have this round soma or cell body that contains the nucleus. We have, for the most part, uh, short little branches called dendrites that will collect electrical signals from other cells. And then um, the cell body will integrate or process those incoming signals from the dendrites and generate outgoing signals to the one long axon. Um, the axon you can see is this one long branch. And we can see that the axon will pass the electrical signals uh, to dendrites or to the body or to other axons of another cell or to an effector cell. Okay, now along the length of the axon, we see these little um, round structures that kind of insulate the axon. These are called myelin sheaths, okay? Um, myelin sheaths are made up of the support cells. In the central nervous system, they're called oligodendrocytes. In the peripheral nervous system, they're called Schwann cells. So these um, myelin sheaths kind of act like insulation to help with the transmission of the electrical signal down the axon. Think of like an electrical cord. We know that an electrical cord houses wires that sends electrical signals um, and that electrical cord is surrounded by a rubberized covering that will prevent electrical signals from leaving the wires and allowing that electrical signal to pass along the wire. So the myelin sheaths act like that insulation to allow for the transmission of those electrical signals. Here we can see the flow of information in a neuron. Again, um, electrical signals are received by dendrites, uh, where it will go to the cell body, where integration or processing of these electrical signals take place. Uh, and from there, the electrical signal will be passed along the one long axon. Um, we can see these little messaging uh, little guys passing that message along so that it can be transmitted to uh, another neuron or an effector cell.
So um, here we see the end of an axon known as an axon terminal. Um, you can see that there are chemicals being passed on from the axon terminal uh, to either the dendrite or another axon or another um, part of the uh, cell that's going to receive the signal. These chemicals are known as neurotransmitters. So um, the space between the end of the axon and the beginning of either the dendrite or another part of the neuron, this is known as the synapse. Um, the synapse is actually a structure that allows neurons to pass information from one to the next. And the chemicals that are being passed on um, are known as neurotransmitters. And these chemicals actually allow neurons to actually talk to one another. So if you look at the YouTube link, um, the YouTube video will show how chemical signals are passed from a neuron along its axon. Now this is known as an action poten potential. At the ends of the axons, chemicals called neurotransmitters are then released so that the signal can be transmitted to the next neuron between a space called a synapse. Um, again, this synapse is a structure that allows neurons to pass information from one to the next. So speaking of neurotransmitters, we have some psychoactive drugs that can be imposters of neurotransmitters. Um, they can be recognized by neurons and alter the normal brain messages. For example, the drug um, component found in marijuana known as THC or tetrahydrocannabinol uh, found in marijuana can mimic regular neuro neurotransmitters such as uh, anandamide. Now, anandamide is a neurotransmitter that can cause sensations such as happiness, and it also influences physiological systems such as pain, appetite regulation, pleasure, and reward. So um, THC mimics uh, the, the action of the normal neurotransmitter found in the brain. We also have another popular neurotransmitter known as dopamine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is responsible for uh, motor movement, motivation, reward, and well-being, as well as addiction. So here we see again at the axon terminal uh, dopamine being released once an action potential or signal has occurred will then bind with the dopamine receptor on the postsynaptic neuron or target cell. Now, on the axon terminal, we have dopamine transporters that will, that will actually um, recycle um, dopamine or um, it, what will happen is it, uh, these dopamine um, neurotransmitters can be recycled through a process called reuptake uh, via these dopamine transporters uh, to help avoid overstimulation um, and to um, allow for these neurotransmitters to be reused. However, we have psychoactive drugs that can also interfere with uh, levels of natural neurotransmitters, um, specifically affecting the reuptake of the neurotransmitters, for example, the drug cocaine. Now, how does cocaine work? Well, cocaine will actually bind with the dopamine transporters to block or inhibit the reuptake so that dopamine will stay within the synapse. So it keeps dopamine around longer in the synapse than it should be. Um, and then nor neurons will keep talking when they shouldn't, uh, causing overstimulation. That's why when someone takes cocaine, they have um, the symptoms of hyperstimulation, agitation, jittery, being, you know, uh, having lots of energy. Um, that's because uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine is allowed to stay longer in its synapse than it should. Now we have three major types of neurons. Uh, the first type is a sensory neuron that receives stimuli and retransmit information to the central nervous system. So, for example, we get a splinter in our skin. We know that this hurts. Uh, that pain that occurs because of the splinter will then be transmitted via sensory neuron back to the spinal cord, uh, specifically the dorsal or posterior portion of the spinal cord, to travel up to the central nervous system.
Then it will be really to what's known as an interneuron. So interneurons will transmit information between the components of the central nervous system. And usually it's either within the spinal cord or within the uh, cortex of the brain. So once this information has been processed, uh, sometimes it can then be taken to a motor neuron. The motor neurons will then transmit information away from the central nervous system to uh, create movement. And we can see that the motor neuron will then have, um, it will then have its effects on muscle, either smooth muscle or skeletal muscle or sometimes cardiac muscle. So here we see a picture of Lou Gehrig, who was a famous baseball player uh, that came down with a disease, a, debil a debilitating disease. Uh, it was known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and commonly referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease. So uh, Lou Gehrig, again, was that uh, famous baseball player who, who uh, played for, unfortunately, the New York Yankees. Go Boston. Uh, another famous person, uh, is Dr. Stephen Hawking. He came down with ALS. Uh, he's an extremely brilliant mind, extremely intelligent. However, because he came down with ALS, he no longer had control of um, his, his motor movements. So as ALS progresses, the degeneration of motor neurons in the brain will interfere with messages to muscles in the body. So because there's no stimulation, eventually the muscles will, will die, will not die, but uh, will atrophy, and voluntary, voluntary control of muscles will be lost. So people with ALS will typically maintain their intelligence, their memory, and personality even in the late stages of the disease. Stephen Hawking, he came down with ALS when he was only 21 years old, and he lived to be 76. So he lived... Um, 50 years with this disease, but we all know that he, you know, had no real motor movements uh, and he had to talk through uh, a robot and had that robotic voice because he didn't have the muscles to help control uh, the muscles um, that allowed for uh, speech. So again, some just general characteristics of the nervous system. We know the nervous system is divided into two main parts. We have the central nervous system uh, and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system made up of the brain and spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system is all of your nerves outside the spinal cord. So how do these parts work together? So we have the peripheral nerves that will bring in the sensory information um, or information about the environment into the central nervous system. The spinal cord will then relay this information to the brain um, where it is processed. And from there, um, we have signals coming from the brain uh, going towards the periphery. Uh, the spinal cord also is in charge of our reflexes. And we know that the the brain's most important part is to process and act on information coming from the environment. So just a quick look at the anatomy of the spinal cord. We know that it is a tube of nervous tissue extending down from uh, the brain. It is protected by the vertebral columns, specifically the vertebra within the spine. Uh, which are a bunch of bones interlocking. Uh, and we have pairs of spinal nerves that will serve different parts of the body. Okay, so nerves going into the or towards the spinal cord will relay sensory information from the periphery going towards the spinal cord and then go up, uh, usually the dorsal aspect or the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. And any motor information coming from the brain or any motor controls coming from brain, the brain will then go down the spinal cord, usually the anterior portion uh, of the spinal cord. So we can see um, the spinal cord being surrounded by protecting co protective covering called meninges. Uh, and we know that the spinal cord will then go through that um, uh, that space within the uh, vertebral column. Here we see a gross uh, specimen of the spinal cord. If we kind of reflect uh, the back skin and, and the back parts of the, verte uh, the vertebrae, we can see uh, the spinal cord and the spinal roots and nerves leaving uh, or going into the spinal cord. And then on this um, aspect here, we see the roots 
um, of the peripheral nerves and then we see the peripheral nerve itself. So nerves are actually just a bunch of axons bundled together. That's what an actual uh, nerve is that can transmit signals. So speaking of the peripheral nervous system, we know that um, it's all of the nerves outside the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system actually carries information into the central nervous system as well as away from the central nervous system. Uh, the sensory division will bring um, information into the central nervous system, whereas the motor division carries information away from the sensory or central nervous system. So again, um, anything, any stimuli or sensory information coming from the outside environment will go towards the spinal cord um, and then usually up to the cortex within uh, the brain that processes the sensory information from there. The brain will then send this information to the motor cortex of the brain to send a motor signal down the spinal cord and then to uh, the peripheral nerves to um, usually uh, a, a muscle or a gland or some effector organ. So uh, the motor division again carrying information away from the central nervous system, um, sometimes controlling skeletal muscle. We know that control skeletal muscle is voluntary. We can pick up a pen um, when we have decided we want to pick up a pen, whereas control of organs and smooth muscles are usually involuntary. Uh, for example, the smooth muscle contained in the lining of our digestive system. We're not sitting here um, consciously telling our digestive system to bring the food that we swallowed to our stomach. This is all under involuntary control. Now, under the peripheral nervous system, we also have the autonomic nervous system, okay? And from there, we have our uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic responses. Our sympathetic responses um, are responsible for the fight or flight responses. For example, if we have a dinosaur coming towards us, we either decide to fight it or we can uh, run away. Normally, we would run away from a huge dinosaur. Um, whereas parasympathetic responses, they're uh, responsible for our rest and digest functions. So um, parasympathetic will allow us to uh, digest the food that we have eaten. So again, consider the scenario where you grab a hot object, you pull your hand off, and then you later will feel pain and treat your wound. Um, these reactions, again, are caused by reflexes and made possible by the spinal cord. So we have a pre-wired circuit of neurons known as the reflex arc. These are automated and quick responses to a stimulus. In this case, with, um, that stimulus being that hot uh, flame from the candle. So here we see that reflex arc. We see a hot object. The sensory neuron picks up that um, hot sensation. Uh, from there, it will go to the interneuron located within the spinal cord, which will then send a signal to a motor neuron within the uh, anterior aspect of the, um, of the spinal cord. And that motor neuron will then uh, send a signal to the, um, the skeletal muscle to take our hand away from that hot object. But how do you feel pain? Well, don't forget the spinal cord also will re relay um, sensory information um, such as pain, uh, again, to the sensory cortex within the brain. Um, so that is where we uh, sense uh, the pain coming from, for example, any muscle soreness. Uh, so pain messages are sent via peripheral nerves and up the spinal cord to the, to the brain, specifically uh, somatosensory cortex located within the parietal lobe. Uh, and then the brain will interpret the message as pain. Uh, it can sense the location, the intensity, as well as the type of pain. So if we didn't have a brain, we wouldn't have any pain, which is true in all sorts of different aspects. So let's take a look at the brain. We know that the brain is the command center. And we'll take a look at what the different parts of the brain do that uh, we know so far. Um, and uh, as well as the anatomy of the brain. So the brain processes and acts on information. 
And we know that there are certain areas that process specific types of information. Uh, for example, we know that the uh, front part of the brain, known as the frontal lobe, is responsible for motor control as well as concentration, planning, problem solving. There are some little areas for speech and even um, areas that um, help us with our sense of smell, um, just above the nasal cavity, actually. So that is the frontal lobe. We also know that the frontal lobe is responsible for such things uh, as reasoning and judgment, as well as personality. Um, then we have the parietal lobe in yellow that has our somatosensory um, cortex where we can sense things um, such as touch and pressure as well as taste uh, and uh, proprioception or body awareness uh, around our environment. Um, and then the, uh, the back portion of the brain known as the occipital lobe is responsible for vision we have the lateral portion or the sides of the brain known as the temporal lobe um, that's responsible for hearing. We know that our uh, ears are right by the temporal lobe. Um, so most of the temporal lobe is responsible for, um, for auditory senses. And we even have a part that is responsible for facial recognition. Uh, we also have around this area um, the part that's responsible for language as well as reading and then at the base of the brain we have what's known as the cerebellum which is responsible for our coordination and balance. So we have three main anatomical divisions of the brain based on um, how they develop. There's the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Uh, technically speaking, we have four main regions of the brain. Um, we have the cerebrum, the diencephalon, uh, the brainstem, and the, uh, the cerebellum. But if we divide them into um, how they develop uh, embryologically, we can uh, divide them into forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. So the hindbrain... Uh, that has uh, the part of the brain known as the brainstem, uh, we can see uh, sort of does look like a stem, but it is continuous with the spinal cord. So the hindbrain contains the pons as well as the medulla oblongata. Okay, so the pons controls autom automatic functions such as respiration, uh, micturition, uh, and same for the medulla oblongata. And then at the base of the brain, again, we have the cerebellum um, that is responsible for controlling basic and skilled movements. Uh, basically, the cerebellum helps to refine um, large movements and make them more skilled and precise. Um, it's also responsible for balance. Um, I think when, for example, if, if you ever get pulled over for a DUI and you've been drinking, we know that alcohol has a huge effect on the cerebellum. Um, so usually police officers will have you do a, um, a, a sort of test to either walk the line and, or a finger to nose test to test whether or not your balance is intact. Uh, because again, if it's not, it's because the alcohol has affected your cerebellum. Now, can you survive without a cerebellum? Well, apparently you can. Um, there was a case in which a woman with no cerebellum had only mild to moderate symptoms despite um, not having one. Uh, this was an article done uh, in 2014 by Chris Weller. Um, definitely an interesting read. So going to the forebrain, we know the forebrain contains uh, the cerebral cortex, the large part of the brain that uh, we see most of, uh, responsible for perception, voluntary movement, learning, and more. Uh, we have, we know the cerebral cortex is divided into two hemispheres, a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. And there's a structure known as the corpus callosum that bridges the two cere cerebral hemispheres together. And that's located here in pink. Now below the corpus callosum, we have um, this, the area, the major brain region known as the diencephalon. The diencephalon contains the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is involved in motivation behavior such as thirst and hunger, and also is uh, responsible for controlling homeostasis by using set points such as um, our, our regulatory thermostats.
So what exactly makes us different than our primate relatives? Well, um, more than likely it's because we have a very highly developed frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is most highly developed. It helps initiate motor activity, responsible for speech, as well as conscious thought. However, we can't really tell whether or not primates, other primates have conscious thought because they can't communicate to us. Um, but we as human beings, we know we have conscious thought, um, you know, it, through literature, through poetry, through the written word, uh, through, um, you know, through things that we communicate verbally. Um, also, we have a parietal lobe that will help interpret the sensory information coming from uh, such sense organs as the skin. We know that our occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual information. And then here we also have the temporal lobe uh, that helps interpret auditory or sounds um, and help us comprehend language. But how do we know? How do we figure out how um, what brain regions do what they do? Well, back in the 1900s, there was a neurosurgeon known as Wilder Penfield, who actually discovered the brain is organized into maps of the body. Um, if you look at this um, YouTube video, uh, we see that a patient uh, was undergoing neurosurgery and they were awake the whole entire time. And he actually um, was working on a patient who was suffering from seizures. And she complained of smelling burnt toast just before she would have her seizure. So what he did was he actually opened up her brain and tried to stimulate the area of the brain uh, that was causing the seizures. So he would take a probe and um, he would ask the patient what she was experiencing. And he finally found an area uh, where she said, um, you know, oh, I can smell burnt toast. And that is exactly where um, the area was being affected and causing her seizures. So Dr. Penfield was definitely innovated in, in, in that, that he was instrumental in making groundbreaking advances in the treatment of seizure disorders. From there, we figured out that specific regions in the cortex correspond to specific parts of the body. So we have a map known as a homunculus. So if we take, for example, uh, one of the cortexes of the brain, either the motor cortex or the sensory cortex, we can see that different parts of the cortex um, will either receive sensory information from different parts of the body or will send motor signals to different parts of the body. So for example, the inner part of this uh, cortex uh, starts off with um, being responsible for sensory information uh, from the foot, going up to the hip, the trunk, the arm, the hand, the face, the tongue, uh, down to the larynx. Okay, so this is known as a homunculus, which maps out uh, what parts of the cortex correspond to these specific parts of the body. So why are some parts of your body more sensitive than others? Well, probably because of the number of neurons or the specific type of neurons uh, that go to specific parts uh, of the body. Another part of the brain that we want to talk about is called the hippocampus. Uh, so the hippocampus actually is this structure that kind of looks like a seahorse. And we know that the hippocampus is very important um, and it's an important part of what's known as the limbic system or the emotional brain. Um, so the hippocampus is responsible for navigation as well as spatial orientation, learning and memory. We know that short-term memories are stored in the hippocampus and then long-term memories, um, the hippocampus will convert short-term memories to long-term memories. And how do we figure that out? So how do we know how memory works? Well, if you take a look at this YouTube video, we have the case of a patient um, whose name was Henry Molaison. We shall call him H.M. So Henry, or H.M., cracked his skull when he was a young boy and had seizures to the point of blacking out. And now he asked a daredevil neurosurgeon, Dr. Scoville, to perform surgery that would remove the hippocampus, 
which again, we said was part of the limbic system associated with emotions. Um, and at that point, the rest of the functions of the hippocampus were really not well known. However, once the hippocampus was removed, his seizures stopped, but he was unable to form new memories. For example, he could eat multiple meals in a row because he didn't remember whether or not he had eaten previously. So a PhD student by the name of Brenda Miller studied HM at his home, and she was able to run a series of tests that would eventually contribute uh, to uh, our understanding of short-term and long-term memory, as well as motor memory. So because HM's hippocampus was damaged, he was not able to remember facts or dates within the short term. Um, and then further testing showed that his motor memory um, was still intact. So, for example, he was able to draw a star between two lines um, because we know that motor memory is actually saved in other areas like the cerebellum. So a simplified version of how you form and store long-term memory, we know that, again, sensory information comes into your cortex uh, via the spinal cord, goes up to the sensory cortex within the parietal lobe. Um, sensory information can then travel to the hippocampus. Uh, we have proteins that will help to strengthen the connection between the neurons in that area. And we know if it is important enough, then it gets sent to the cortex for long-term storage. So HM could form initial impressions, but without the hippocampus, uh, the memory is basically eroded like messages written in the sand. So we talked about um, sensory information, but we actually have our sense organs that help um, transport this sensory information. We have our eyes, we have our ears, our skin, our nose, as well as our tongue. Um, so sense organs carry messages about the environment to the central nervous system, and we're going to just talk about uh, the eyes. So the vertebrate visual system works when um, we have photons of light that enter the eye and strike the rods and cones contained within our retina. Uh, this is how vision begins. So we can see we have light transmitting uh, what we can see as colors of a tree entering the structures within our eye, which will then be transmitted to uh, the rods and cones of the retina contained um, within the back portion or the posterior portion of the eye. From there, the photons of light will be um, transferred into signals that will be transported by the optic nerve going to that occipital lobe or the back portion of the brain responsible for uh, vision or visual primary vision centers. Um, so it is actually the brain that sees. The eyes more or less um, transmit the photons of light um, and convert them into uh, chemical signals that be, can be seen by the visual cortex of the brain. So in terms of visual perception, again, does begin in the eye but ends in the brain. Light is collected and focused in the eye. It, uh, the light information gets converted into electrical information and sent to the optic nerve. Uh, we know that the optic nerve meets at this um, structure where it crosses over, known as the optic chiasm, where information from each eye is then routed to the visual cortex located within the occipital lobe or the back portion of the brain. So again, information is processed uh, in the visual cortex and uh, the perception of vision occurs here. And that is one of the main sense organs that we're gonna talk about uh, in this chapter. And you will be taking a look at a sheep brain dissection in lab. So that's about it for the nervous system.